Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the second event on the morning session of the Global Offshore Wind Summit Taiwan uh, Taiwan Virtual. Uh, this session is kindly sponsored by VD Renewables, uh, and the topics that we are going to speak about is on renewable and energy storage session. Uh, and we have uh, John Kandahu, who is the head of the ESS of the Asia Pacific. Uh, let me kindly introduce you to him and let John uh, take over the floor. Hi, John. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Ravin. Um, just a second, I share my slides. Um, hello, good morning, everyone, or uh, good evening, uh, good afternoon from those uh, uh, dialing in from the other parts of the world. Uh, today I would like to talk to you about the battery energy storage for wind energy and par with the, particularly with the focus on the lessons that we have learned from uh, solar uh, photovoltaics. Uh, so this is on the agenda for my talk today. So. First, what I want to talk, what are the lessons that I want to talk about that we have learned is mainly about the quality assurance and managing the technical and financial risks. This is for us at VDE, the main, the main purpose is to take the, take the risks out of the emerging energy technology or at least manage these risks. Uh, so first we have to have a look what is the actual role in the battery-based energy storage uh, systems in the renewables and then which are the risks that need to be considered when you are implementing those uh, battery energy storage systems. We will look at an example of the accidents, what can go wrong. Uh, we will look what is the quality assurance and how the quality assurance is not just the compliance to standards but also the implementation of the best practices and in the end I will wrap it up by describing our VDE approach and look at our track record as well. So, as you know, in, the, in any new and the progressive energy field, you have uh, numerous technical risks that will later translate into the uh, financial uh, risks. Uh, the wind energy is no exception. Uh, so, basically for us, the motto is no compromises with quality assurance. This is why we look at the certification of the components on the one hand, but then on the other hand, also the bankability programs, due diligence reports, and uh, independent engineering with the purpose of the quality assurance. So from our 25 years of experience and lessons learned, mainly in the solar PV, but also in the energy storage, uh, we have identified, let's say, five areas of risks where the risks arise from. Of course, the most obvious one would be the, uh, the components where, for example, you get the risks related to non-compliance to the standards, uh, bad performance, um, when the state of technology is surpassing actually the international standards. The next one would be systems um where the project is not properly developed the installation not done properly operations uh, uh, not uh, uh, not done in compliance with the best practices the next one will be the grid interconnection the connection point of the system to the grid where the grid codes are lacking standards if there is no proper grid interconnection the incomplete offtake agreements, uh, which is followed by uh, installation quality. If, uh, the risks here are the biggest risk here is having insufficiently trained installers, design failures, fragmented execution with too many interfaces. And last but not least, there's an offtake and rating risks, which uh, is a country risk political risks and reliability of the subsidies and incentive 
So that's the non-technical, non-technical part of the risk that maybe our colleagues from Munich Re will share more about. Um, so to look at uh, certain experience, uh, a certain expensive, uh, a certain um, um, a certain lesson learned from the PV. Uh, there is an example for of a uh, 18 megawatt power plant in the in the UK, where the VDE assessed the power plant after the system performance started declining after only uh, four years of operation. So the issue was that the DC cables were were buried directly into the ground, but they were not rated for this type of application and started to 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 fail. So uh, this entire incident actually costs uh, more than a one and a half million euro losses. So we have a seven digit losses after four years of operation only. Whereas the proper quality assurance assessment would have costed only about 4% of this uh, remediation cost, these losses that were caused by the uh, by the improper by the improper installation, also by the lack of the quality assurance. So, where's the business case? It's quite clear. Uh, so, here's an example for the uh, for the PV power plants, where you can see from the Fraunhofer's annual assessment of the PV power plants in Europe, uh, where you can see that the blue the the, the blue bars they are they are uh, so they are. Um, ordered by the performance uh, ratio, the, the blue bars represent the new plants that had the quality assurance system and the, con and the continuous operation and management, either by us or uh, one of our competitors. And you can see there is a very clear business case uh, towards the highest per uh, to higher performance ratio if the quality, uh, quality assurance uh, procedures are properly implemented. So now that brings me to the role of the batteries in energy storage for the renewable energy. Uh, so as, as you know, with the increasing share of the renewables in power generation, for example, the, between the years 2007, 2017, we have seen 17.5% increase in the uh, European Union and uh, 100 new gigawatts of the photovoltaic commission in the past year. Uh, of course, uh, you are aware of the intermittency of the renewables that requires the storage. And now if we look a little bit in the future, here is the pro here are the projections for Germany by the year 2050. That's, not, that's only 30 years from now. Um, they are projecting to implement 110 to 190 uh, gigawatt hours of total storage, of which between 40 to 120 gigawatt hours would be batteries that would be used to uh, supplement uh, 190 to 500 uh, gigawatt of total renewables out of which between 120 and 290 is uh, photovoltaics and the large part of the rest, of course, wind both onshore and, uh, and, and offshore. And uh, here on the, on the left side of the slide, you can see the different uh, technologies for the store in terms of storage capacity and the discharge uh, time. Discharge time is the availability of the storage. So you can see for the very low discharge time, uh, such as for frequency regulation, spinning reserve, you need the flywheels. And for the very long, longer discharge charge time, higher energy, uh, the hydrogen or the synthetic natural gas can, could be used as a storage. But then you have an area in between, uh, which is particularly for peak shifting and covering the intermittent nature of the renewables, that uh, is covered um, that is covered mainly by the batteries and uh, what is the business case here for the batteries is also clear you can see the price developments of the lithium ion batteries over the last decade 
there is a, there has been um, almost 90 percent drop in the prices per kilowatt hour which is mainly the average drop uh, here is a 20 percent per year that's mainly due to uh, technical improvements such as higher energy density cathodes and however in the future the rate of the price decline may slow down due to the cell shortages the oligopoly of the fewer global manufacturers and of course higher requirements for higher demand for the electric vehicle batteries um, nevertheless uh, this is a this is a very clear uh, this is a very here this is a very clear case for the energy storage uh, powered by the batteries because you see the huge decline in the the prices and uh, very uh, um, accompanied by the increase of the supply accompanied by the newer technologies better quality every year um, which of course give, which is, which of course give us a very strong case for the battery based energy storage systems also for the wind energy now, uh, as, as you all may be aware of, uh, the battery energy storage is, uh, relate, is um, associated with a very special kind of technical risks. Um, you have probably heard about the many battery related accidents and fires. So we have a, here we have a risk that is very specific to the technology uh, and is um, can be clearly distinguished from the risks that are related to, uh, to, to photovoltaics or to the wind technology, for example. Uh, so the, we, there are two basically two groups of the risks of the battery energy storage systems. Uh, so what we're gonna have a look uh, in the next part of the presentation is what makes the lithium ion batteries inherently risky what can go wrong with them and how where do those risks uh, arise from uh, what are the properties of your system that are affected and how are these properties interconnected and of course what happens to battery during its lifetime on the other hand we will look at the risk on the application level uh, we will uh, overview the battery energy storage systems risks by starting with the component and subsystem risks uh, followed by the system design risks then we have installation and site related risks uh, uh, followed by the risks of uh, related to operation management and maintenance and i will wrap it up by some examples of accidents and their causes so First, let's answer the question, what in the first place made the lithium ion batteries burn or explode that often? So it's a very inherent feature of the lithium ion technology is that you have a higher voltage on the cell level, which, uh, uh, which, which, makes, which actually is responsible for the increased energy density compared to the alkaline, lead acid, nickel metal hydride and other batteries. Now, if you have higher, uh, if you have higher voltage, uh, you cannot use a, a common battery-based electrolyte because it would electrolyze the water in the electrolyte. So you have to replace the, the water-based aqueous electrolyte by an organic one. So by this, you have on the one hand ensured the, the, uh, the metastability, the thermodynamic metastability of the, of, of the electrochemical system. But on the other hand, you have a flammable component now. The, the electrolytes of the lithium ion batteries are, uh, are, 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 are flammable. And you can see that this, this gives you a fuel for the potential fire or explosion. And this uh, metastability, so the fact that you still don't have a completely stable, electrochemically stable system gives you a trigger. And that of course um, leads to a certain danger. Now, let's put, this in the, uh, let's put this in the context of the so-called fire triangle that the people, uh, that the safety engineers worldwide are using to evaluate risks of the fire or, or explosion. 
so you need the fuel, which we know it's already it's a flammable electrolyte uh, of the battery cell. You need a trigger, which is the energy stored stored in the cell, and you need the oxidant, for example, the oxygen from the air. Now, let's have a look at the example of a very common lithium ion battery cell. It has an energy storage capacity of 9 watt hour. Now, the cell, the typical lithium ion battery cell, the cylindrical type with the energy storage capacity of 9 watt hour, will possess the combustion uh, combustion heat of uh, combustion heat of the uh, of the electrolyte uh, six times as high with the uh, the 50 the, the 58 watt hour will be only the combustion heat of the electrolyte available and this electrolyte has a flash point of about uh, 20 degrees centigrade and the auto ignition temperature of about 450 degrees now, if you add to this the fact that there is a, that, that the lithium-ion battery also contains a, an anode made of carbon, that adds another 80 watt hours of, um, of the combustible matter to the battery cells for only 9 watt hours of the energy, the electrical energy that you can store. And if you add the separator and the other polymeric components, you basically end up with more than 200 watt hours combustible material, uh, a quarter of which is very easily combustible with the flash point below low, low temperature, so that's your fuel. Your trigger is the energy storage that can be released in an uncontrolled manner in event of short circuit, uh, as well as your oxidant may come from the air or even from the materials that are built inside the cell. So uh, the, a lithium ion battery is an inherently unstable uh, system. So for all good that it has brought for us, for the portable devices, for the revolution in, uh, in the smartphones con connectivity, for the revolution in the uh, storage for energy storage system, we always have to keep this in mind that for every, that for every kilowatt hour that you can uh, uh, that, that you can uh, store a useful energy from the renewables there is about 20 kilowatt hour energy that released that, that is just waiting to be released in the uncontrolled manner so now let's have a look what happens with this uh, batteries during the lifetime uh, lifetime so the lithium ion cells is a closed system uh, there, there, there will be a, some irreversible aging processes happening inside. Uh, disordering, corrosion, gas evolution, uh, growth of certain layers. Let, let, let's not go too much in the detail. So the first effect of this will be the decrease of the capacity. The next one will be increase of the internal resistance of the batteries. So that is re that 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 both uh, leads to the drop of the cyclic efficiency of the cells. So how much energy you put in and how much of it you can still get out, uh, which leads to the excessive heat generation. So you have uh, you will be dealing with the safety risks due to the higher temperature, and of course the vicious circle of the accelerated aging because you. Your system is now suddenly due to the aging effects and the loss of the efficiency operating at the higher temperature. So let's look here at the example. So the leftmost bar is a reference, new battery cells, and the, the, the other four are differently aged cells, where you can see uh, you can see on the left axis the heat released in the joule during the discharge of the batteries. And on the uh, and on the y uh, on, on on the right hand axis here the black line is uh, the efficiency of uh, it's the efficiency of the battery cell. So what you can see is that you that you have a significant loss of the energy efficiency as a consequence of aging. So you can see that the new cell will produce. Uh, uh, three point uh, about 3.8 watt hours of heat 
for 100 watt hours of electric energy during this charging. So it's a normal, that's not combustion, that's a normal heating of the battery during the operation. But uh, the, the, the aged cell, which has only four percentage points lower energy efficiency, is producing more than double amount of the heat per uh, 100 watt hour energy, electric energy throughput. Uh, did you consider that when you were planning the heat management systems for your, uh, for your system, right? It's important thing to have in mind. And even if even here, let's say we have a half we have a half percentage point drop in the energy efficiency. Uh, we can talk about the significant. We can talk about the significant more than ten percent increase in the heat load during normal operation. So that's a little bit background to uh, inherent risks of the lithium uh, lithium ion battery cells, mainly safety and the performance during the aging and the safety of the aged cells. Uh, so now I would like to uh, look at the overall uh, risks of different kind, on the different kind of levels of the technology, starting with the components and subsystems. Um, so the batteries, as, you, as, as I explained before, they are prone to thermal runaway you can have a pro propagation of the thermal runaway to the adjacent cells and modules. Um, there is a, always a performance and efficiency issue with, which can cascade into a safety issue on the one hand. On the other hand, if the, cell under, if the battery system underperforms, it's a financial risk. And of course, the lifetime where you have a degradation of the internal, uh, of the internal components. Um, the energy management system, battery management system, power conversion systems, which are auxiliary components around the battery, are also carrying certain risks. There is risk of communication failures. There is risks of improper integration of the systems and the non-conformance with the grid requirements. Uh, same goes for the auxiliary components, which may sound a little bit trivial, but as you have seen with the previous example of the PV, uh, cabling, things as simple as cabling may be an issue, protective systems, environment systems in terms of temperature management or inadequate housing of the components, they all add up to the, the components' technical risks uh, towards the system. Now we scale up to the system design. Uh, there are three main risks here. There is a risk of improper dimensioning and ratings of the auxiliary systems. Uh, renovations and upgrading are often hidden risks because of the lack of the risk analysis and the evaluation before doing any upgrading to the system or renovation. And of course, the safety features, if they are inadequate safety distancing, is there a lightning protection system, fire extinguishing system, and of course, control and surveillance system of your battery storage system. The next one is the inherent risks of the, of the site. Uh, looking at the environmental impacts, human impacts, which could be both unintended damage or the purposeful vandalism damage, uh, risks of system to the surroundings, and of course the uh, adjacent facilities that may be also source of fire, source of uh, electromagnetic in interference and similar. And finally, the operation management and maintenance related risks, where it is, uh, it comes to the personnel involved, where there may be issues with the competence, people not being properly trained, um, improper operational procedure, uh, lacking the quality control, risk management, uh, inadequate emergency procedure, uh, improper tracking of the system uh, in terms of document control, and of course, nowadays, cybersecurity. So to give an example, we can have a look at the Korea energy storage system fires, which happened uh, in 2018, 2019. There were 23 large uh, uh, 
uh, fires and the megawatt range energy storage systems have been affected. They were they were two types of the system. They were peak shaving for PV and the industrial load shifting ESS systems. Uh, so almost half of the Korean energy storage systems were suspended at the peak of these fires in the first quarter of 2019, and there were millions of dollars in damage. The, the Korean authorities uh, have conducted an, in, in, an investigation in which we also helped partly, and they have found following reasons. So there were insufficient protections against electric shocks, uh, mainly due to the ground faults and the short circuits. Um, the, the, the fuse that was supposed to stop that uh, failed to interrupt, so the whole issue cascaded over the bus bar in the container. There was inadequate management of operating environment, uh, leading to the large swings in temperature that leads to the degradation of the insulation. And of course, the faulty installations with the faulty wiring uh, during the installation. And of course, the ESS system integration uh, issues uh, leading to inadequate information sharing between uh, energy management system and power conversion systems, uh, which led to the failed abnormality check. So if you look at this whole point, as a result of the investigation, you can see that none of it is directly related to the battery cells or the battery modules, but of course, because the battery cells are inherently flammable, it led to huge damages. But none of this, uh, none of these causes of the accident um, is related to, let's say, improperly constructed battery. It's all about implementation. It's all about management. It's all about operations and installation, of course. So now let's have a look at the, what are the, the different risk sources that affect energy storage systems and uh, what are the properties they affect. So the, the risk sources, as I mentioned before, are about the components and subsystems, system design, installation site, and the operations and management. Now, the properties that are affected by these different sources of safety, uh, of course, the most uh, the most immediate one, the, the performance and efficiency, and the lifetime. Now, safety poses immediate risks, and the lifetime is a long-term risk, also in terms of being a financial uh, risk. So, in order to manage these risks, we have to manage the sources of these risks, and there are two ways of doing it. There is a... a to ensure the compliance with different standards and norms, which is easy to do with the components and subsystems and much less so with the operation and management. And of course, implementation of different best practices, which, uh, which, is, uh, which is as the systems grow in the complexity down to the operation and management, which is the way to go. So, uh, the risk management, of course, uh, the quality assurance is the cornerstone of the risk management and the quality assurance uh, is done in the following steps. So we have to evaluate, you have to evaluate the energy storage technology, you have to review the components, component design in terms of performance and safety, you have to review the manufacturing processes of the components, uh, followed by the system level testing and certification and then in, in the end of the day project review and evaluation, a review of also of management, constructions and operation and then of course have a risk management plan uh, review evaluation. So how to devise a holistic uh, risk management uh, system? So here is our approach. Uh, the first thing is to have a very good application guideline which consists of requirements and the best practices. 
It, it covers designing, installing, and managing ESS. It also covers requirements for the compliance of the components. The next one is the criteria catalog, which is a li list of relevant criteria that are tailored to your application. Uh, it consists uh, also of a checklist that enable evaluation of systems versus the guideline. And this checklist is a basis for, for your inspections and audits. Uh, so you can establish a procedure of regular inspection, audit of compliance documents, which can be done either internally or it can be done by independent uh, bodies such as uh, VDE, for example. And uh, the way we see that uh, for uh, on the VDE side, our approach is called the VDE quality pyramid. So it consists of the three layers of quality assurance. So in the very beginning, you have compliance of your components to the established international norms, standards such as IEC, which is a standard market criteria for entry to the market. That's pretty much what we see as a reactive approach. So you are basically only following your basic regulations. So the next stop, the next step is bankability and insurability, which takes into account the expanded test criteria, uh, which is more up to date with your market requirements and the state of the art in the technology. This is a responsive approach because you, you keep in pace with the state of the art so you are able to create better quality and a financially sound projects. On the top of this pyramid is looking at the individual quality criteria for each project and their unique selling propositions. Uh, so these are the tailored solutions. And uh, this is a proactive approach uh, where you are considering the unique specifics of the projects you can engage, it enables you to engage in the superior quality assurance where you minimize risks and boost the profitability of your project. Now, you may say, okay, I don't, I don't need this. I don't need the upper two. I will just take uh, a standard market criteria here, which enables me to enter the market. But in the new technologies such as battery energy storage, these are often missing. So you end up with nothing. If you end up with nothing, you are exposing yourself to high risks of losing the right to operate, exposure to the high financial liabilities, risks of lawsuits, and of course, uh, loss of the reputation. So with that in mind, I would like to thank you for your attention and hand over uh, back to Ravin and uh, to the interesting presentations that our colleagues from Munich Re have prepared. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jan. Thanks for those insights. Uh, we have Dr. Mark and Chiharu-san from Munich Re right now to offer us their perspectives from an insurance point of view in order to mitigate and remedy the risks and challenges present um, ESS today also as described by Jan earlier. So can we have Dr. Mark, please? Yes, hello, this is Mark speaking. Uh, so I, unfortunately, my camera does not work. Um, so you will see my presentation only. Uh, one second, please. I just try to bring it up. So can you see my slides? Yep, yes, we can. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, uh, so thanks for giving me the opportunity to introduce our energy storage warranty insurance. Um, this is something that I would like to present also in conjunction with our very new approach, also technologies as a yeah, molecule-based energy storage system in addition to the electric, uh, so battery electric uh, energy storage. I will keep my presentation rather short uh, as of 10 minutes and then hand over to my colleague Chiharu-san for, for the wind energy cover. Briefly introducing Munich Re. Munich Re is the worldwide largest reinsurance company. So, and uh, in spite of being a, a huge um, uh, uh, yeah, reinsurance company, 
we're having mostly the traditional risks as insurance covers. We also have very customized long-term solutions for technologies and our teams consist of yeah, uh, many industry experts as I myself am and also Archie Harrison is. Um, the financial strength of Munich Re uh, is illustrated by its balance sheet uh, was close to 290 billion euro a group result last year of 2.7 billion and our uh, yeah, constantly high ratings of uh, A plus, double A uh, and so on. <clears throat> Introducing Munich Re Green Tech Solutions. So uh, Green Tech Solutions is a special entity within Munich Re scattered around the world with offices in Tokyo, Hong Kong, Munich and San Francisco. <clears throat> and uh, we provide long-term performance warranty insurance backstops for as well manufacturers as also for project owners in three main sectors. This is the renewed, uh, established renewables like solar, wind and inverter technologies. Then what I was focused on today, the smart energy and energy storage section was yeah, battery energy storage plus immobility and the second uh, aspect, hydrogen power to gas, uh, followed by some innovative technologies like fuel cells, uh, cyclic economy, and so on. But uh, my focus will be energy storage, immobility, and hydrogen. So our risk appetite and what we already did provide uh, to, to, the, uh, to different industry clients are battery energy storage systems based on lithium ion technology and redox, redox flow. <clears throat> um, this uh, we introduced to the market close to two years ago. And our next step is to tackle the complex system of energy storage. We are actively working on pilot cases for the entire electromobility and hydrogen generation. Why electromobility? So usually uh, cars, for instance, are for 95% of the time stationary devices and being connected to the grid, they can contribute to the overall energy storage capacity of, uh, of the, the electric grid and yeah, are uh, valuable assets that can, can contribute to our energy systems. In addition, in order to also uh, do sector coupling, we are in the process of uh, doing pilot cases for hydrogen energy storage power to gas. So something that might be very relevant for large uh, offshore wind uh, installations, as it's also in, for instance, in Australia for large solar, ex uh, uh, for large solar parks, um, as the step that we are focusing on uh, this and the next year. And in future, we will also be able to cover second life applications of former uh, mob, uh, mobile applications from uh, energy storage systems. Uh, so how does this, um, uh, how does this setup uh, of ensuring energy storage uh, works? Uh, a manufacturer usually is our directly insured either manufacture of better energy uh, storage systems, hydrogen uh, uh, technologies. And uh, this uh, uh, manufacturer uh, is yeah, insured by Munich Re, providing a manufacturer warranty to the project owners. So uh, these manufacturer warranties are usually also pretty long-term warranties of up to 10, 15, or even 20 years. And uh, over the course of this time, there might be some issues coming up, even in terms of the solvency uh, of either the manufacturer or, uh, or um, the most important component suppliers like battery cell or module provider. So that the situation of honoring the manufacturer's warranty is endangered by different, uh, different aspects. For reasons of this, our insurance cover that we always do with the local primary insurer has also uh, a second path uh, of the so-called project cover where 
the project owners, uh, the investors or lenders can be the beneficiaries in case that there's uh, a problem with the manufacturer honoring its uh, manufacturer warranty. So, uh, yeah, illustrating this on a, on a, in a different view, uh, usually uh, our insurance is um, uh, sold to the manufacturers. In some cases, we also do individual projects independent of a manufacturer, but this usually would require some rather uh, rather large uh, installation. I guess for offshore wind parks, uh, energy storage systems that will be installed um, in parallel will definitely fulfill this uh, criteria. But uh, the, the special thing, the special feature, what is very important to all these um, um, performance warranty insurances, no matter if it's for battery-based energy storage systems or power to gas applications, is that uh, there is a, a long-term coverage so that the entire uh, financing term is uh, covered by insurance um, or even the entire warranty term that can even exceed 10 years. So from, from uh, insurance point of view and really to provide investment protection for, for the lenders, it is very important that this is a non-cancellable situation where the insurance party also cannot step out after a couple of years if claims uh, occur and even not in, uh, in, ter uh, in the case of uh, uh, potential insolvency of the manufacturer respectively uh, its core suppliers. So the, the cover, especially for, for the um, large projects that get named uh, to Munich Re to the insurance, uh, even exceeds this potential insolvency state and then cover the project even after uh, a manufacturer's de uh, demise. So um, our green tech uh, team has a yeah, energy storage uh, um, uh, a group of specialists. Uh, it's our um, global head of green tech, Michael Schramm in Munich. Uh, also uh, Sebastian in, in uh, Munich, uh, Jay in United States. I myself uh, in Hong Kong and a uh, colleague of Chiharu-san, Michio-san based in Tokyo. And yeah, so. Uh, with these closing words, I would like to hand over to uh, my colleague Chiharusan. Thank you, Mark. Happy to ask yep. questions uh, later on if, if this is coming up. Thank you, Mark. Uh, looks like uh, Munich D has a, a video uh, issue, <laughs> and uh, I cannot uh, properly project my myself on the screen, but I think. Uh, no one's care. I'm a grumpy old man, late 50s. So <laughs> I will just uh, draw your attention to my presentation. Since I'm in the same team as Mark, I will skip the Munich Re part and the, the green tech solution part. I am Tokyo based and um, my focus is onshore, offshore wind. My, also, my geographic coverage is a uh, broader APAC region, including Taiwan. Please, can you flip my slide a few pages? Okay, next one. Next, please. Okay, here. Um, no, the, the previous slide, please. Sorry. So for clarification, uh, we are not writing conventional insurance such as construction or risk or operational risk that uh, normally put in place for offshore wind parks to cover typical, I would say, insurable risks such as property damage and bodily injury, etc. The, those insurances are done by our insurance colleagues from the insurance perspective. Um, we offer risk transfer solution for relevant technology providers and service providers who are set to take peak risk embedded in the business. And this is the product offering by uh, Green Tech Solutions for the wind sector. 
the left hand side we have serial loss cover and EPC cover. These are covers for peak risk that OEMs and EPCs are taking through long-term performance warranty, providing for the owner, operator, investor of the wind park. I will talk more on these cover, especially EPC cover, as they are more relevant to the audience who has interest in Taiwanese offshore wind market that comes with local content requirements. The next one is a O and M cover. This is a cover for owner. No, uh, previous slide, please. Sorry. Next one is O and M cover. This one is for owners, operators of the wind park or the independent service providers for unscheduled maintenance costs, which is also a peak risk that owners, operators, or independent service providers are taking. The next cover is a lack of wind cover and wind energy yield cover. Lack of wind cover is a cover for wind resource and wind energy yield cover is a cover of wind resource, i.e. the p-value and availability of wind turbine and efficiency of the wind park. Hence, ultimately we can guarantee annual energy production in gigawatt hour form on a long-term basis, 10 years. So literally, if the tariff is fixed through the PPA, we can guarantee the revenue on a long-term basis. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Sorry. Please go to the next, okay, thanks. This is the evolving, evolving situation surrounding the wind industry. Firstly, due to fit regime transforming into auction regime, the industry is under huge cost pressure. Also, increasing number of financially strong sponsors are chasing after a few large scale projects. So naturally, global competitive pressure is there and increasing. Also, financially strong sponsors and investor banks force the contractor to take more contractual liability on a long-term basis. Finally, we are in the uh, uh, rapid technology race. Wind turbines get bigger and stronger to generate more production. However, the flip side is when turbines get more susceptible, susceptible to breakages or defects. This evolution in the offshore wind industry inevitably gives more pressure to contractors for wind turbines and EPCs, hence requiring additional insurance cover. Please go to the next page. Next page, please. Loving. Thank you. Here I laid out the typical setup uh, to develop, construct, and operate offshore wind park. WTG's foundation, cable, substation are the critical technology to construct and operate offshore wind park. And each technology is constructed by EPCs. EPCs procure what they need from the suppliers or subcontractors. Whatever those EPCs guarantee to the owner operator in terms of performance of each technology is uh, ideally back to back covered by respective guarantee by suppliers and subcontractors. However, there is a gap in terms of timing and value. Please go to the next page. Rabin, thank you. Warranty by EPC starts upon takeover and typically for long term, like five years. And value that EPC warrant is up to 100% of contract value, plus in many cases, offshore cost, offshore cost, whereas guarantee by suppliers or subcontractors typically start from the delivery of relevant components and parts, which is well before takeover, and expire typically sooner after takeover. And value that suppliers or subcontractors warrant is up to 100% of subcontract value. Here, notable trend is given the competitive pressure in the contractor subcontractor relationship, 
recently subcontractors may have to bear offshore costs on a long-term basis. Please go to the next page, Robin. So in any case, EPC contractors or suppliers, subcontractors, have to take increasingly bigger peak risks of offshore wind park. And there are currently two solutions available to them. One, take peak risk and book them entirely on the balance sheet, which may be doable and possible if EPC contractors are financially strong. The second solution, get EPC cover from Munich Re and transfer a part of the risk via insurance structure. Here on this slide, I laid out how the existing insurance solution work uh, in this uh, situation. The construction of risk can take a fraction of the obligation that EPC contractors are taking during the so-called maintenance period, which is typically one or two years from the takeover. And the whatever construction or risk can take needs to have physical damage. Operational risk, on the other hand, is uh, useless basically uh, for the, the risks contractors are taking because they are for the the normal breakage and uh, stuff. Uh, so OAR is no use in this uh, situation. Please go to the next page, Rabin. So what we cover, we cover repair or replacement for defective components with or without physical damage. Also, we cover component suppliers warranty default, default from the restrictions and in some cases insolvency of the supplier. Also, we cover the offshore logistics, logistics costs, including crew vessel mobilization of the vessels, etc. We also can cover probably with a sublimit because this is a risky proposition. Um, otherwise, with a condition during warranty work, what we call is a weight on weather uh, cost. So those are the, basically the, the cover we can provide to the, the contractors. Please go to the next page, Rabin. Finally, this is the setup of the uh, green tech solution for the offshore wind industry. So Matthias Harman based in uh, Munchen will be the underwriter of those uh, cover. And I'm the business developer based in uh, Tokyo. In Asia, in the last two years since I joined Munich Re, I, I worked used to work for GE Renewable Energy prior to the Munich Re, by the way. We have uh, provided cover for OEM and supplier and help them transfer risk from their balance sheet. If you are EPCs or suppliers who cannot sleep well due to warranty you are providing to owners operators of offshore wind park, or if you are owners operators, or developers who want to be competitive in Taiwanese market or any other market uh, in Asia or the rest of the world who comes with a strong form of local content requirement. Perhaps uh, it's worth to spend time at least for an hour with us. Thank you very much. That's it for my presentation. I'm open to uh, questions. Yeah, I would like to thank everyone for attending this session and please be welcome at our, uh, at our VDE booth for the discussion. Uh, I'll be there this afternoon, uh, looking forward to Looking forward to meet you. So I'll be there at the booth today between 4 and 6 p.m. at the, 
at the booth uh, for till 6 p.m. Uh, Taiwan time. Yep. Uh, I think we have a question from Murti Noni. Uh, questions for Chiharu. Are you able to provide cover for nearshore projects in Vietnam? Um, uh, yes, uh, we can cover uh, 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 the performance warranty by the contractor. But if you are on the other side of this, uh, the, the transaction diagram, i.e. owner operators, we have also cover for you. Our cover is uh, unique in a sense we uh, customize our, our you know, uh, terms and condition uh, to suit the needs of the party we are talking to. So my answer is yes, we can cover and uh, let's have a, a chat after this uh, uh, session. Great. Thank you, Shiharu. Um, so yep, I'd like to bring this um, a session to a close. Our next session is at one thirty in the sessions area. Uh, meanwhile, do visit the networking area and the expo booth where we have VD uh, having the presentation. We have LOC and as well uh, next wave as well um, having presentations at their booth. Um, thank you so much for joining the session and stay safe and have a good day, everyone. Bye-bye.